Good morning, uh, everybody from the West Coast. Good afternoon to everybody on the East Coast. And good evening to everybody uh, in Europe and uh, in Asia. So I hope uh, everybody has had a, a wonderful couple of weeks since we last did our Fit in Museum collection conversations. Um, my name is Kevin Jones, and I am curator of the Fitta Museum, and I am right now looking for Christina, here she is, to invite her uh, to go live. Uh, we are going to be talking today about um, ourselves, uh, but also the, the field itself. We receive lots and lots of questions about what we do, how we do it, how we got into our profession. So I wanna uh, just say Kevin Jones, curator of the Fitting Museum, and just joining us today is... I'm Christina Johnson, and I'm associate curator of the Fitting Museum. That's right. So I think if I were to title today's uh, conversation, it would be called Childhood Dreams. Yes, yes. Exactly. Yeah, because we're really going to be going far back. I cannot believe <laughs> and, we're showing these photos. <laughs> yeah, so for those of you who have seen uh, the announcement for today's conversation, um, I'm sure that you saw uh, our photos. This one is mine right here. Here is little Kevin when he was about 11 years old. And here I am at about age eight. I'm sorry about that glare. Oh, there you go. About yeah, age you can eight see years it. old, my amazing ensemble. So, um, yeah, Christy and I were actually really happy that we each had kind of equal awkward photos to share this week. Um, now, Christina. Yes. So, You've been interested in dress history for what? What, two years? <laughs> Maybe a year and a half? <laughs> I, I think since the minute I was born, <laughs> to be honest, yeah. Yeah, it's tell always me, been a lifelong interest. Yeah, tell me about that photograph and how it relates to your career today. Right, well, from a very young age, you know, maybe three, four years old, I was always attracted to big ball gowns, beautiful hoop skirts, and you know fairy tales and then i became interested in historic fashion so it meant a lot more to me if i knew that that was a victorian woman wearing that in that child's book or um an 18th a woman in the 18th century and i just it was just this appeal i was intrigued and then i wanted to know about the history of it and i started like many children playing dress up and my mom and i would go to thrift stores and we would find 1950s, 1960s, 70s ball gowns, and I would love dressing up. And the photo you just saw was actually one of my mom's uh, bridesmaids dresses from the mid 1970s. And in my eye, because of the high neckline and the full sleeves, the pointed bodice and the very, very full skirt, it was authentic Victorian attire. And I was so happy to put it on. But of course, I didn't stop there. I needed to accessorize it. And so I would often have head pieces. For those of you who just signed on, I'm gonna show again. I would have veils. You can't quite see, but I have some pearls around my neck. And then of course, no lady would go outside without a parasol. So you see my pink umbrella there. Uh, and I was, I was so happy to, to dress up in this. And Kevin knows a little bit more about, about this ensemble. So I didn't just wear it in the comfort of my home, right? You can see this is inside my house and, and all of that. Oh, no, no, no. I enjoyed wearing this outfit outside to walk my dog. Um, so here I am outside on the sidewalk, but you'll see the dress looks a little bit different. Do you see the bottom there? Well, that's because I made, I made myself a hoop skirt out of a hula hoop. So, and the little ball would still roll around as I walked. And I just loved, you know, walking my dog, wearing this down the street. And there's more. I also like to wear authentic headwear. You saw that veil earlier. Well, I discovered that if you turned a basket upside down, you know, there's the, the basket part and then the handle, you turn it upside down, you could put the basket on your head and the handle would come underneath. And in my eye, 
that was an authentic Victorian bonnet. And so it was really dress up and learning experientially that, that sparked, sparked my love of historic fashion. Right. The, um, I think it's interesting how for both of us, it started uh, really early before we knew anything about a profession or about, you know, dress history as a just being drawn to it, just an interest. And I think it shows that all children have these innate interests. And that was mine. Exactly. And um, how fortunate, honestly, that you and I both ended up in families where um, our creativity and our interests were really um, championed, maybe the wrong word, but encouraged and not discouraged, which, you know, so many kids... Yeah. Um, you know, and especially for, you know, you and I are older now, and uh, it was a different world back in the late 70s and in the early 80s um, than it is now. And it's great that we have so many more opportunities for young people to be able to express themselves. And uh, I- I've always felt very fortunate about that. For my photo, this is actually me sitting on the staircase at my parents' house. And obviously, you can see there's Snoopy yep. with me. Um, so I was enamored with the same things you were, pretty dresses, hoop skirts, big, full, you know, embroidery, all that kind of stuff. And I was also really enamored with Princess Diana. And so I decided to recreate Princess Diana's wedding dress for my Snoopy. And um, I actually have it right yeah, here. I was hoping. Oh. <laughs> That's why I had to pop off. I'm, I'm always I... leaving the stuff I need to show on the other side of the room. Am I boring him? <laughs> yeah. No. Oh, so yes. here, here's the dress. Yes. And all of the little embroidered pearls and so forth. And I was real proud. I, I mean, I'd never taken pattern making classes. And I just looked at the photos of her oh. and I just made the patterns. Here is the train. The cathedral length here. train, that's right. Yes, of course, with you know all the other pearls embroidered on. I remember going to the fabric store with my mother you know, to, to get the fabric and it was literally three, or no, a yard and a half of this fabric left. It's all that was on the bolt and we bought that and it was on sale because it was my mother and she's always looking for sales. Sure. Um, you know, so that was really fun. And then um, he, this is the little petticoat. Oh, that I haven't seen that. To I go don't... under the dress. Okay. Yeah. I've seen Snoopy, but not the petticoat. And Princess Diana had a little gold horseshoe stitched in under her petticoat somehow or something. Let's see if I can get this to show. Now, so I, there's I, my little gold horseshoe. <laughs> now, how did you find out all of the details about her ensemble? I know you stayed up to watch the wedding, but how did you find out about uh, these yeah. details to copy? Because I was nine when the wedding happened, uh, that you know, and um, I literally woke myself up at nine years old, at like one o'clock in the morning, to watch the wedding live on TV. Um, you know, and my aunts and so forth, they they all knew I loved it, and so I ended up getting books on Princess Diana and the okay. wedding that Christmas. So I was reading all the stuff and that's when I decided to make the dress. And so it took me about a year and a half to work on it. So in that photo, I'm, I'm 11, but the wedding was it when I was, when I was nine years old. So, um, you know, this is something I cherish and I still have Snoopy uh, as well. Snoopy sits on my bed, <laughs> um, just not wearing Princess Diana's wedding dress. <laughs> and, you know, so I just think it's really fascinating that, you know, you and I as children really gravitated to this field and I, you know, we have questions today to go over that uh, thank you, all of our viewers mm-hmm. uh, sent in earlier this week. And, you know, it's to talk about how we got into doing what we wanted to do. Obviously, it starts with a, an innate passion. And my philosophy of life is whatever your passion is, that's what you have to follow. I know that sounds cliched and maybe, you know, a little generic. But if you don't have a passion for something, you're not going to put your all into it, your heart into it. And what you end up doing is going to be a job versus, you know, a career. And, you know, I think you and I both, Christina, feel fortunate that we don't go to work. We, we do what we love. Um, Now that said, there, there are things that you need to prepare for in order to do whatever it is that you want to do. 
Uh, and then you have to have, uh, you know, the right place at the right time kind of situation. So one of the, the, our questions is, what made you fall in love with fashion history? Well, Do you know? yeah, that's a really good question. Obviously, I'm, I'm a visual person, so it's literally seeing the objects. But I think what means the most to me is that these, these objects, these things that people wear, um, this is nonverbal communication. This, this right. represents people, and I'm talking about history, obviously, because my primary area of interest is the mid 19th century. It's just, it's just record. It's this record of, of life that is no longer there. And it's the closest we can get to history and to these people. And so the stories behind the, the garments, the accessories are what, what intrigue me, I, I, if that makes sense. Yeah, for me, I think it's, it's being so desperate to want to go back in time mm -hmm. to actually see the, the events happen. I'm not a part of the events, but to see them actually happening, to see the people getting dressed, to see the people moving in the clothing, to see the people in the environment, the architecture, the artworks, you know, everything surrounding it, the music, yeah. the smell of the food, all that kind of stuff. And, it's, and for me, it's, a, it's such a longing that that's what drives me and my interest in it. Um, yeah, I'm so, also so intrigued with people, their stories, w what they think that I enjoy seeing how people express themselves today through fashion as well. I just I like seeing this communication style. Yeah, and how it changes at exactly. any given time. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so a question, what, what and where did you study? We've received that question multiple times. Okay, so Christina? right. My path to a career in fashion history was not exactly direct. In high school and my first year of college, I was actually a music major. I was a flute performance major. And, you know, I decided that that was not right for me because I'm, I'm not a natural performer. It takes a lot out of me. And I knew at the same time I had been studying so intensely flute and music that I had this dual passion of fashion history. And I decided to after my first semester at a, a college, I, I, I stopped. I stopped and I reinvented myself. And I actually went to Santa Monica College, a junior college for one year. I did all of my basic requirements and I, I crammed two years into one because I wanted, to, I wanted to transfer. And I knew at that point that I wanted to go into art history. And I, I did go to UCLA. Um, I got my BA in art history, specializing in 19th century. And then uh, I had heard of the NYU Costume Studies program. And I thought, I, I didn't know exactly what career would be my aim in this field at that point. I knew that I, I just knew I wanted to study fashion history. And so I went to uh, N NYU. It was an amazing experience. I adored my time there. At that point, our, our classes were literally in the Costume Institute. My first day of class, we were in Richard Martin's old office. He had just passed away. So I remember being there and just being surrounded, just surrounded by all of the books that, that hadn't left the shelves yet. And I, as I said, I love my time there. And, uh, and that, that's my education. But along the way, I, I just said that I wasn't quite sure what uh, career I wanted. And so I made sure to do a bunch of internships. I did internships at the Santa Monica Historical Society. I did an internship at Butterfields, which is an auction house uh, here in Los Angeles. I did the Costume Institute, LACMA, the New York Historical Society, the Merchants House Museum during my time as an undergraduate and graduate student because I wanted to be exposed to many different tasks and just see what I enjoyed and see what I was good at. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it's at the Costume Institute during one of your class sessions that you and I met and we relayed that story. Oh yes, the infamous story. And if, and if anyone yeah. out there is interested in the infamous story of how Kevin and I met, you can see it on our, our first live, I think. Which our is second, YouTube. something. I think yeah. it's the first live we did and that is on our YouTube channel. Right. Well, my background is slightly different and slightly the same. Um, you know, it, it, I'm right now at home, I am going through boxes of old stuff and paperwork and, and things and I'm filtering through and I'm getting rid of a lot of stuff. And I was, I actually found a newspaper article from high school, the high school news. I went to Buena High School in Ventura and I was interviewed along with this other, this other girl. And she, we were talking about like what our future is going to be and what we want to do. Oh. And mine was, I wanted to be a fashion designer because I did not, 
you know, fashion history, everything I designed was based on historical dress. Um, I didn't know you could be a curator. I didn't really know what that was. But I wanted to be a fashion designer. I wanted to work for Karl Lagerfeld. Oh. And then I wanted to, yeah. And then I wanted to open my own. How do I not know this already? How do I not know this? I've forgotten about it. I mean, I was reading this newspaper article. Just, I was just, in, just it was amazing. <laughs> and then I wanted to open my own couture house in Paris, of course. Um, you know, go right to the top. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and so through high school, I was in all the art classes and theater classes, and it was, you know, lots and lots of fun. And then uh, in my English class and senior year, the, one of the reps from FITM came and spoke about the school, and I was entranced. Mm -hmm. You know, I was just like, wow, this is it. This is what I want to do. So I ended up going to FITM and uh, studying fashion design which I'm really glad I did because it gave me a really solid understanding about the construction of dress, not just historic dress, but, you know, clothing, because we had to do draping classes and patterning classes and, and all that kind of fun stuff. And um, it, it's helped me ever since to understand when I'm looking at a historic garment, how that garment is created, and therefore what does it actually do on the body or as for us, the mannequin body, mm -hmm. because that's how we, we dress our, our people. You know, that's been a big help. So I got my AA degree in fashion design. And I have to brag just a little bit that I was uh, summa cum laude. I was straight A all the way. Um, it was definitely the, the right path for me. But huh, then I felt really bad and felt very guilty because I'm fortunate my parents paid for all of my schooling. And I did not want to be a fashion designer afterward at all. No way did I want to go into this profession. It was everything about the museum field and historical dress. And even with historical dress, I wasn't interested in like the theater world or movie and cost, uh, TV costume design. It was, it was the actual objects. Remember going back to my childhood of so desperately wanting to go mm -hmm. back into the past. So then I went, uh, to, just like you, I went to the junior college uh, after FITM to take general classes uh, and then that was for a year and then I transferred to the University of California at Santa Barbara for art history also and I got my bachelor's degree in art history. Then I was fortunate or right after that I moved out of my parents house and I got a job at LACMA, mm -hmm. the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, like literally within the month and I was there for three, four years before coming to FITM. So I never went on to grad school. So the height of my education is a bachelor's in art history because my career got in the way. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've always felt guilty, truly guilty, and that I don't measure up enough for the FITM Museum <clears throat> because I never had got a graduate degree. You know, maybe down the road in retirement years, I might go back to school just for fun but right now I'm doing exactly what I always wanted to do. And um, one of the questions also, you, you touched on it, Christina, about internships, uh, how important are internships mm -hmm. for future curators, scholars, historians, academics. Um, I think you and I can both agree that they are very, very important. It's yeah. to get as much experience as possible. And I think, um, the experience is not necessarily directed just to the profession that you want, but it's any experience that surrounds the world that you're interested in. For us, it's art history. So, you know, I, I volunteered uh, to do stuff at LACMA. I volunteered, um, in mine weren't internships, but volunteers, with uh, doing in small installations uh, such as uh, um, uh, up the street from here, the uh, Academy of Motion Pictures, Arts and Sciences the, 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 mm -hmm. at the Paley Center, you know, and it was just joining the Costume Society of America expanded uh, the, the, this whole realm for me going to um, the vintage clothing shows in Santa Monica. Oh, I, I did that got, too. I did yeah, that too. Got to touch all but this stuff. I do want to mention that we were very lucky in that we lived in urban areas with museums, yeah. historical societies, and other organizations. And we had the time to be able to volunteer and perhaps not have to work. Uh, so it's important, I think, and at the FITA Museum, we are funding more internships more and more so that students can have those stipends for support. I know growing up, I, I did not really go to museums. That wasn't something we did. 
Uh, but I was always drawn to historic fashion through the books that I would get from the library. Yes. And I would see museum exhibition catalogs and wonder kind of what they were like. I remember there was one trip in between Santa Monica College and UCLA. There was, it was a really big deal. My parents took me to Washington, D.C. There was a major painting exhibition I wanted to see. I had just taken my, my basic art history classes. And, you know, it was a big deal because we didn't go on vacations. And I had done all this research on the, um, the um, you know, different history museums there and the National Gallery. And I just remember going into the First Lady's Gallery, which I had studied up on, and just being floored. That was a defining moment. And seeing, I believe, Mrs. Cleveland's floating bodices uh, you know, they were like an invisible mount and they were floating on monofilament. And of course, I did not all the, know all the tricks of the trade, but I remember seeing it lit like a jewel box. I, you know, I was about 20 years old and just going, oh my gosh, this is what I want to do. And that was a life changing moment for me. And I think that's one reason why I went on to grad school to study this. You know, I did not know the exact position I wanted in the museum. All I know is that I wanted to work with historic fashion and that's it. But it truly was it's just etched in my mind, that experience of the First Lady's Gallery. It was astounding. And I was so lucky to have that experience. Yeah. So we got to move on because, okay. you know, time, time, time. Okay. Um, schooling is over with. How did you become a curator after university, specifically a fashion curator? Mm-hmm. Well, personally, I started at the Fitta Museum not as a curator. I was a collections manager, and I, I loved that job, and I, I still love it. I love the organizing, interacting with researchers, being with the objects in that, that quiet storage room. And then I was given the opportunity by you to co-curate the High Style Betsy Bloomingdale and the Haute Couture exhibition. And I went into it thinking, oh, I don't, I don't know if I can do this. Well... You know, I, I would like to see if I enjoy it, and I would like to see if I'm good at it. And you know what? I was both. <laughs> I, I was well, good at it, and I really enjoyed it. And, you know, I think that we learned that we made a great team curating together and for that particular project. And then I was given the opportunity to become associate curator of the museum with you as curator, and I went with it. I think that you, you touched on two interesting points, really important points. One is that you took every opportunity, you know. I mean, you were really happy just to stay a collections manager. Mm -hmm. But I could see that you needed to be a lot more because um, you, you, just your innate talents. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I thought, no, 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 we need to start working together. And also, really, it, you know, I, I don't know how it ever happens, but if you can find a close collaborator, a close business partner, a close colleague that you end up clicking with for some reason. And because I know what I have, Christina, you don't have. Mm -hmm. And I know what you have, I don't have. Yeah. And therefore we balance each other and we, we, we give each other the things that we need. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's really important to, to to analyze yourself, to understand that, yeah, okay, uh, I'm really good at doing this, but also what am I not good at? What am I not good at in the profession that I'm interested in? And can I find people that can help me with my deficiencies? You know, it's really smart to, to think about these things because, you know, they, it, it's, it's, it's not glamorous. It is a lot of work. It's a lot of schlepping mannequins around mm -hmm. and you know you study research something for four hours and you find not one grain of 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 knowledge that you can use for the project you're working on i mean it, it just it can be very tedious at times and you know to be able to 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 go to you always and to complain or to be excited because i found something and then you do the same thing with me is something that really is important to keep that level of commitment going and that passion going. Yeah, it is. It's amazing to work with, with you know, a partner when you speak the same language with a great team. And that's certainly something I've learned on the job. You know, you come from school, whether that's your AA degree, your BA, your MA or more, and you've done so much learning and reading and writing and all of that is so important and no education is ever wasted. 
However, when you get to the real world and your job, there's a lot more that you need to contend with. There's people to meet, whether that's your coworkers, your donors, you know, learning about budgets, learning about IT issues. I mean, it really is the real world. We're not just sitting at our desks looking at books all day. Although sometimes I wish we were. <laughs> and you know, sometimes we do. We have those sometimes days. Yes. Yeah, once in a while we have those, those great days. Or when an object comes in that we've worked really hard yes. to acquire and we just sit there and stare at it all day. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. But I know I've learned a lot on the job. Um, so, you know, how do you become a curator? Or how did you become a curator at the Fitta Museum? Honestly, there is absolutely no answer to that question. And you and I get asked that question all the time. How do you become a curator? How did you get to where you are? What did, what did you do? It just happens to be the circumstance that you and I found ourselves in. Yes, we prepared ourselves really from childhood. You and I had, were devouring every book that we possibly could find as kids just because we were innately interested in it. And then we went through the schooling. We, we, di we did every opportunity that came to us and then we seized the opportunity. I too entered the Fitta Museum as the collections manager. The, the previous collections manager had just left and they were looking for somebody. And I know the, the, the woman who was previously the, the head of the department. And uh, she said, do you want to come over? And actually, I was at LACMA making more money yeah. than when I went to Fitta. So I actually took quite a pay cut in order mm -hmm. to then say, okay, I'm in the museum field. I've now been this year in the museum field for 25 years, but am I doing exactly what I want to do? Or here's another opportunity. Um, it may cost me a little bit, but you know what? It's that idea of opportunity and happiness. And you know, the thing is you can never predict when those being in the right place at the right time moments happen. And I would like to mention, you know, you touched on the Costume Society of America, and there are other organizations such as ICOM, there's m multiple organizations in Great Britain around the world uh, for people with the interests that we have, historic fashion, contemporary fashion. So to become a part of that, those organizations allows you to meet people who perhaps already have positions in the field and meet your peers, because we don't do this in a vacuum. Our friends, right. our, our curators, collections managers, we all, we all work together, sometimes with people we even went to school with. And what I, one, one good thing about this pandemic is that we're learning that we can do these activities and symposia online, digitally. So the uh, issue of being able to afford travel can be taken out of the equation. And I think that it makes it more accessible for people to be part of these organizations when they have these symposia online. You know, and how do you become a curator? Well, right now we are in such a historical moment. We, you know, there are going to be many PhDs written about the times that we're living in right now. Yes. And it's really changing the entire world, the entire face of the, the, the museum field, the cultural field, um, and the abilities to reach numbers of people. I mean, honestly, Christina, you know, 10, 20 years ago, you and I never would have dreamed that we'd be having a conversation with each other, with the world, but from our own homes, you know, yeah. live. Yeah. And it, it, yeah. it opens up every possibility because, you know, what is a curator or what is, who is a historian or whatever? That entire definition is now exploding, expanding. Um, and there are only so many brick and mortar places for someone to work at. There are only so many yes. collections. And I think it's important to mention that, you know, there is, there are curatorial positions, right? Your, your career as a curator, but everyone can contribute to the field in their own way. Right. That could be a blog uh, or a website. You can publish in uh, scholarly journals or, you know, write books. There's so many things people can do. So I, I want to make sure people don't think that they're failing if they don't have that curator exactly. with a capital C because there's yes. really so much that every person can do to contribute and expand our field right now at this very exciting time. You might, all of you out there, you know, watching and, and, and our students um, that are in school right now, you might end up being a curator. And, and that's, that's fabulous if, that, if that's what happens to you. But you also might not. It does not mean that you cannot significantly become a voice within the field and become a go-to person in the field. And, you know, there are people like um, Judith Clark and other uh, independent curators 
who are not connected to specific institutions that have made great marks. They do exhibitions and, and they publish works. Um, you know, and there, there are people who want to go into academia. They like the yes. being in front of students. They want to to pass the knowledge on. There are those who go into the the, the uh, theater and the the recreation world, such as though our colleagues at um, Colonial Williamsburg and and places like that, these historic houses that are very academically uh, driven for authenticity and real true research and depth. Uh, but they want to live it. They want to live within. Those, uh, those garments and so forth to understand how people could move or not move or what they were able to accomplish wearing garments 500 years ago or, you know, 100 years ago. Mm -hmm. So there's, there are many opportunities to, to work within the field. Christina, you, there, one of our, you, you just touched on this and one of our questions is how do you go about publishing your research? Do you, Christina, do you have to be in an institution to publish your research? No, absolutely not. You do not need to be at an institution. There, there are opportunities. It's just learning how, how to, to seize them, right? You know, yeah. many publishing houses have their requirements for submitting uh, proposals online. And that's something I did early on is I just went through all of the publishers, you know, Yale UP, Rizzoli, Prestel, and, and took a look and, and saw what is required. They listed out a, a chapter, your outline, a biography of yourself, that kind of thing. And start from there. Start doing that, that chapter if that's of interest to you. Start working on that paper uh, and, and see what happens. And then you will find a publisher. If, if you put passion into it and you have a, right. you have a good editor too, <laughs> people to bounce ideas yeah. off of, mm -hmm. uh, you'll find success. Mm -hmm. And that's where your colleagues come into it. That's where we, we're always, we're, you and I just don't work together. We, we, we try to contact everybody, you know, at all these other institutions or at schools or um, people that we know of are specific in certain areas that we haven't studied as much in depth. You know, it's, you can call on all of us to, to help. We all need to help each other yes. uh, in, the, in this field. And um, I, I, I think you're right, Christina. It's the, it's the aspect of passion because if you find a topic that you're passionate about, it, it's not work. You're going to go and research it into depths that other people have never thought about. And yes. I think that's what's really important. And if you do that, there are people who are going to be very interested in it. You are going to spark interest in other people with your passion that you're trying to relay this information because it's all about relaying information. Yes, as a and, fashion professional, as a fashion professional, whether that's a curator, a special collections librarian, a contemporary fashion theorist, you obviously need to know your overview your overview of fashion history. But you need to have your passion projects, something you know, like dressing up in my, my Victorian you know, ball gown or you with royalty. You need to have these passion topics because you will become the world expert in that. And that passion and that interest will come across easily in any project you do, whether that is a blog entry or a book or an exhibition one day. We are very fortunate that you and I have, a, a, we get paid for what we do for the FIDA Museum. So we, yes, we are at an institution. Yes, we, we recognize we that. And there are lots of other people who don't have that opportunity yet. Um, and they have to go to a nine to five job. Mm -hmm. But it's that aspect of having the passion. You go to your nine to five job and then you're, you're still contributing to the field and you never know what getting a, an article uh, published in costume in Britain or the other international journals, ICOMS journals, the, the, the dress, the Costume Society of America, what that might lead to opening a door to something else. Um, there's a, a really a great, wonderful colleague of ours in Germany. He went to be a, he was, he, he studied as a conservator in dress first wanted to be a curator. He years and years worked in the field and at the right place at the right, right time, he's now a curator at a major collection in Germany. You know, it's just, it's just, he took every opportunity and it took years for him to finally get to that position. Um, it may happen, it may not, but you still need to keep focused on the abilities that you can contribute to the field. Because, you know, Christina, you and I feel both that what are we doing at the Fitter Museum? We are working to get our collections to the next generation yes. safely. That's right. 
Absolutely. And the scholarship that goes with it, all of right. the records. So we are doing as much as we can in the moment. But guess what? Every curator walks away from their collection at some point, whether that's their choice or not. And, it's and right now, there's a lot of people who are having to walk away from it, not by their own choice. That's right. But it's a huge responsibility to care for a collection as important as the FIDA museums, because mm -hmm. it is up to us and our team to make sure it goes to the next generation. And that's, that's something that's very important to us where we, we advocate for accessibility and passing it on in some form. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing with anybody who may not work in a museum proper, who is interested in researching a topic and publishing that topic, you are passing that information on to the next generation. That, that is, that's the ultimate importance, not necessarily having a title of curator or collections exactly. manager. Absolutely. Or, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yep. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, we are coming out with a book. Um, it was supposed to come out next month, but because of this whole COVID situation, it's now coming out in the earlier part of next year. So we're very happy about that. Yep. Uh, when the show starts to travel, it's sporting fashion or our, our, our out, uh, sportswear uh, exhibition. And, you know, so here we, we are fortunate we have a book coming out. But Christina, you and I had to do all the work that it took to do a book, even though we work at a, a museum. Because I think you and I did probably, what, 90% of this catalog on our couches at home on our off time. Yeah, there's a lot of life invested in these projects. <laughs> yeah. A lot of sitting so, on the couch know, with my dogs next to me, editing, texting with you, saying, I love the sentence, I hate the sentence, you know, the, the right. photo shoots. And so it is fun to think about the, 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 the human aspect in these exhibition catalogs or in these exhibitions. And yeah, it just, it is to learn about the curators too. I'm, I'm interested in, in that. So to me, it's like anybody with an interest in something, go research it yeah. and sit on your couch, you know, yeah, sit on your couch. Uh, and, and, <laughs> and do all of these things. And like you said, there are all sorts of directions. Um, we partnered with the American Federation of Arts uh, in New York City for the Sporting Fashion Project. And honestly, we had to do a tremendous amount of work before the AFA selected us as a partner. That's right. We, we created had, we had, an entire portfolio. We had had yeah. a few photo shoots. So they knew the style. They knew what we were trying to cover, the, uh, the writings, the outline, that kind of thing. It, it was. It and was, let me tell you a story. Yeah. It was the day, the night before we had to turn in this huge oh, no. packet of information. Oh, I know this story. <laughs> we had been working on it and working and working and compiling all this stuff. And I, you and I, I had gotten it finished. It was like 11 o'clock at night. It was like at, 11 o'clock It was like a night. Saturday night. Yeah. I had finished it. And I went to save it. And I did something. And it deleted all of it all of the work that, that we had compiled. Yeah, I remember this distinctly because you called me and you said, Christina, it's gone. And it's I said, gone. What? And I, and I am right now going home. And I said, are you kidding me? I'm going home. Because, I'm yeah, going home. Are you it's kidding? over with. It's done. That was, that was real sad, but the next Horrible. morning we got in really early and we were able to- well, Wait, 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 no, 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 no. Wasn't we it had an morning? event. We had an event that next, on that Sunday. We had something oh, and it was an event. And then the, uh, the event, in ha it happened. I then went into the office and I worked until like That's three right. or four in the morning reconstructing all of that information that had been lost. You know, it was up here. Yeah, it was. You know, it was yeah. fresh. I remember was coming fresh. in very early and we were able to, to get it done. And get it done. And, and we got it submitted. But if this is that, this is that non-glamorous part at four in the morning, you know, after you accidentally delete or don't save or whatever I did, I don't know what I did. And you got to start all over. And, and that has nothing to do with being a curator. No. That has, you have a project, you have interest, and you got to do what you got to do to make it happen. Mm -hmm. So anybody sitting on their couch, you know, who wants to start out by publishing an article in dress, you're going to go through this whole juried process and it's going to help you understand and it's going to make your product better. 
It's the same thing with what we had to do for sporting fashion, you know, all these now years ago, when it was just starting, like, are we going to be able to even do this catalog? We don't know. Um, we had done all the preparatory, preparatory work, right? Then it got deleted. Then we had to start over again. Yeah, so, and it is helpful to have that partnership with American Federation yes, of is. Arts, uh, partnering with someone who knows the publishing world inside and out and traveling exhibitions, because we are a small team and we all do a little bit of everything. You know, if we want a mannequin, we don't, we don't have someone just bring it up. We generally go down and, you know, lug it up. Uh, we have to find it. We get it. You yeah. know, we do it. Uh, at a smaller, smaller institution. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, and the thing uh, along with joining um, professional organizations such as Costume Society of America or um, Costume Society of Great Britain, Costume Society of France, cost every, every country has one. Um, International Costume Society, you know, ICOM. Um, the, you're going to get to know people. Uh, what's sad is that, of course, right now in this year, the New York Symposium uh, oh, CSA had to be canceled. Symposium. Yeah, that's but there's so much now that's happening online. You can get to know people now online. You just have to be really creative about it and, yes. and yeah. figure out what works for you, for your personality, for your interest, for your time, for your finances, for where you are located geographically. But there are ways of breaking through. And no matter what, if you end up with a title curator or, you, or, or not, you can contribute and you can break through. And it just depends on how much um, you're, you're willing to put into it, your passion, and seizing every one of those opportunities that comes along. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, one last question before we have a little wrap up is, um, what does your average day look like? Well, what tasks do you do? Well, are we talking about right now working mostly from home or during an exhibition or during a courier trip, during uh, trying to make your midnight deadline for a catalog? It, it really varies. It really varies. Right now, as I, as I have uh, been working at home most days, I have been lucky enough to catch up on some collections projects. We're getting more of our Past Perfect database online. And I've also done a huge amount of Rudy Gernrich research. I have a real interest in Rudy Gernrich. I am in the, the beginning stages of writing a catalog raisonné based on the Rudy oh, Gernrich art. You are. Is that a surprise to you? Oh my oh. gosh. Uh, uh, the catalog based on the archive at the FITA Museum. And so I've been really lucky to plow through all of the things I've been meaning to get to when we have our normal in-office and exhibition schedule. Um, so that's been an amazing experience to be immersed, immersed in that. So, you know, I wake up, do my yoga, have my tea, and then I go right to my desk and, and start, start going for it. That's it. We have a, a comment. Association of Dress Historians in the UK. Anyone can join. You don't have to be in the UK. And I they love also their journal. They also quarterly journal, yes. which is fabulous, it's by the way. And, and it's free. They just give it away. And we, it just print, yeah, we print them out and keep them in our office. Yep. There's amazing courses in that. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So there's another opportunity to get to know people, to get your work published, to get yeah. out and there. There's an opportunity for your bio to go in it and, and everything. Right. So, mm -hmm. right. Exactly. so what's your typical day like these days? You know, it's been really interesting because, of course, it's no longer typical. Yeah. We are, just to let everybody know, we are... Uh, we have access to our office, collection storage, all everything. And we all, nice we've and been safe. going in because, of course, it's a yeah. huge responsibility to have a museum collection. And so we do need to go in and walk the aisles and check the temperature right. and humidity. Uh, right. We have to do that. Um, but for being in the office, we have elected to come in on different days, each of us. Mm -hmm. We overlap sometimes, but we have our office spaces that we can, that we can distance from each other. And because you know, we have been working so hard to get so much of our content digital, and we continue to do so, we're, we're, it's not fortunate right now, but it's, it's convenient that we are able to access a lot of what we need to do from home. So we, we have become hybrids uh, in, our, in our office. Our office might be in the office, but this is also my office, uh, you know, daily. Well, I feel like so, it's, our homes have still always been our office because you and I text, you know, if you find something online or through a dealer and it's after 5.30 p.m., you're not going to wait until right. the next morning to let me know no. for us to discuss it because we need to take those opportunities. So I'm, I'm always on. 
for the Fitta Museum. I, and even when I am going into the office, I generally will wake up, I'll do a bit of research or check certain newsletters and blogs and go in. So it's, it's constant because, you know, there's a lot of information, a lot going on out there uh, to keep up with. You know, and the world's become digital. And I, it really, this, the, the pandemic, this, this whole COVID situation is, is going to permanently change the, the museum. Now, all of us, and I'm talking about institutions around the world, have been working to digitize our collections and create our own databases and so forth. And that's, that's fantastic. But who knows, down the road, very, very soon, it may be that, you know what, why don't we start partnering with each other and helping each other digitally in ways that um, bring all of dress history together. Or if you're interested in period silver, or if you're an, an archeologist and all of the, the, the things you find in the digs and, and so forth, you know, and it's to create these, um, these world databases. And I mean, yeah. there are others like Europeana that have already been working to, to kind of mush, push that forward. But I think sometimes when you have a world event like this, it will create a lot of permanent change that will be for the good because it causes all of us to think in new, interesting, inventive ways, just like introducing our collections conversations. Yep. So we only have... <laughs> Right. So we only have a few more minutes um, okay. before Give the, the hours. <laughs> and I'm very cognizant about not being cut off because I got cut off once and I was really embarrassed. But um, since this, this whole conversation is about childhood dreams and we all have childhood dreams, um, some dreams come true, some don't. I have to say I am not a billionaire and I don't live in the Breakers Mansion in Newport, Rhode Island. I know that was your so dream. That, and that, people, literally, child, that, what, that is his dream. <laughs> it's true. That, that childhood dream yet. It has not hasn't happened, happened yet. yet. Yet, right? You've got to stay positive and yeah. you've got to stay hopeful. <laughs> ah. uh, and other childhood dreams have come true. Yes. I didn't necessarily know what a curator was or being ever able to work in the museum field, but this dream has come true, the same for you. But since we are talking about collections conversations and that it is about um, the pieces in the Fit a Museum collection, you and I, interestingly, have both had our childhood dreams, garment-wise, come true. Yes. Yours happened uh, in 2017. Mine happened last year. Mm -hmm. Crazy. All right. So I'm going to show Christina's childhood dream. No, don't show the dress yet. Oh, okay. Do not show okay. the dress yet. Okay. okay. Because I need to build up to it. <laughs> okay. okay. So okay. I'm going first. Okay. <laughs> so when I was in high school, I discovered this book. And I know it's going to be backwards for you. It's called The Woman in Fashion. Okay. Yeah, I'm really sorry about that. But maybe you can see a little bit of it right here. And I'm going to take this cover off because it's cramping my style here. Um, it's called The Woman in Fashion, and it is an overview. It was published in 1949 by Doris Langley Moore, British uh, costume historian, and it is an overview of Western women's fashion from the early 19th century to uh, the 1920s, and I'm showing you just a couple of pages. You can see women actually wearing historic pieces with Doris Langley Moore's writing. These were from her collection. Correct. Yes, these pieces were from Doris Langley Moore's own personal collection. Now she did not the collection. Yeah, not the collection that she she founded the Museum of Costume and Bath in 1963. It's now called the Fashion Museum, and she founded that collection with a donation that she had amassed from many many people in Great Britain. But at the same time, she had her own absolutely amazing private collection, which is used for this book. My very very favorite photo is this one right here. I'm gonna go slow so you can see it. It is the actress Vivian Lee wearing a late 1870s gown, tea gown. And I just fell in love with this image. I think she, she was a beautiful woman. The dress itself was so striking with that embroidery. And I thought, oh, I wonder what color that was. I wonder what the fabric was because of course you can't, you can't see it in the, in the photo. She does describe it as bottle green that could be so many different colors. I have no, I still have no idea what that, what that means. So 
I and, and did it even survive to today? Did it even survive? I mean, what was it? So anyway, oh, we only have 10 minutes. I have to do, do this real fast. Um, yeah. <laughs> or you're going to have to do yours next time. <laughs> so anyway, it was in, what, 2010 that we first learned of the Helen Larson collection. And one yeah. of the first ways we learned about that was through an Excel spreadsheet. No photos, mind you, about a thousand pieces on this Excel spreadsheet. And one of the cells in it said, Vivian Lee, woman in fashion. And I thought, are you kidding me? Is, is, it that, is that that dress? But what a random assortment of words. And I'm so glad that as a child, I memorized books like this, right? right. And uh, yeah. so we, we went to the storage facility. And of course, I had asked to see that particular piece before we brought the collection on loan to fundraise for it. And it's one of those instances when you're going through the tissue and you're looking and okay, now you can show the detail photo. I you saw, want to see the detail? Yes. I, okay. saw, I saw the actual embroidery and the color under the tissue in the art storage facility and I couldn't handle it because that's the first time I had seen the dress in color. It's a beautiful ombre, exquisite, a very unique aesthetic looking color, you know, gorgeous. And then Kevin, show the, show the uh, photo, the overall mannequin photo too. Okay. So we were successful in acquiring pieces from the Helen Larson collection. This piece was um, funded by an amazingly supportive couple, Jody and Jerry Gorlick. They supported the acquisition of this particular piece. And see it, isn't it amazing? So to be able to, uh, oh, hold on, keep yeah, holding it hold, up. Hold yours out, hold oh, yours gosh. out. I took, my, I took my bookmark out, it's gonna be a second. Um, you know, <laughs> and with the collection, pardon me as I, as I look for it, with the collection, we acquired Helen Larson's papers archive and she acquired so much from Doris Langley Moore. And it turns out through correspondence that she used this book very much like a catalog and said, oh, can I have Vivian Lee's dress on page such and such? And I, with later research, because it includes Doris Langley Moore's papers, someone I'm really interested in, this dress turns out, and I know this because of an interview she did in the late 80s in, with the Fan Circle International, this particular dress was the first piece to enter Doris Langley Moore's private collection. And she acquired it during a game of Christmas charades as a newlywed in the 1920s. It had belonged to her mother-in-law. And her mother-in-law said, I bet you can't fit into this. And Doris Langley Moore said, yes, I can. Of course I can. Women's bodies haven't changed that much, just our underpinnings. So it was an amazing, amazing experience to be able to see this dress, not only to see the dress in person, but all the correspondence that the Fitta Museum now holds from the Helen Larson estate. Okay, you got nine minutes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so your childhood dream for this of this one dress came true. It did, and it was an amazing experience. Yeah. Yeah. To have that connection and then to see it in person. Okay, so my childhood dream dress. I always tend to like everything that's exaggerated you know it's so like you know like the, the six really? three, three, <laughs> you know supermodel women and you know long necks and and high cheekbones <laughs> with the with the 50s painted makeup and all that kind of stuff um so and i cannot find the book i pulled this from the internet because i, thought, I cannot find the I book that this photograph's in. did you not find it in my office I looked and looked and looked, and I have all my books here, and I, I, I can see it in my mind's eye, but I cannot, I, I don't know what book it's in. Okay. It, it's, I'm sure it's in multiple books, but the book that I would have seen as a child, that's the thing, it's like, what, what was I looking at? Um, so my favorite dress when I was a kid was this. <laughs> this is a portrait of Norman Norell, and I didn't really care about him. <laughs> Dovima was what I was That's attracted right. to. Yeah. I mean, because, you know, she was so extraordinary. Like, she might be born kind of with those proportions. I don't know. And then this incredible striped gown, and it's all, in, you know, embroidered in sequins. And I loved embroidery, and she looks, you know, extreme. And one of my all-time favorite films is Funny Face with Audrey Hepburn and Fred Astaire. It's a musical, and it's about the fashion world, and... Um, Dovima is in it at the beginning. So, you know, it was just, this, it, all of this tied together. Um, and so I just fell in love with this picture. Well, fast forward, you know, 35, 40 years later, and I am on Etsy, which is one of those, you know, selling sites um, for clothing. 
and it's late at night, it's probably 10 at night, I'm still at work, and I'm just kind of scrolling through, and I literally stop on this photo, because I was like, what, huh? This cannot be what I'm thinking it is, because all it was was this much. It was literally like the top of the dress that you could see in the photo, crazy. No reference to Norel, nothing like that. Well, I bought it, of course, immediately. <laughs> Here is that dress. Okay, and so what, the reason why the, the dealer, and we got it for almost no money, the reason why the dealer had no idea that it was Norman Norell or, you know, Googled Norman Norell and popped up with this photo saying, oh my God, here's the dress, is because this dress is not labeled except for a um, hand-inked twill tape on the inside of the bodice that says Joanne 122. This is the original model of the Roman stripe dress from 1956. It's been published as 1959 in a recent Norel catalog. That is not correct. The dress is from 1956. And here is a detail of the gorgeous embroidery. Um, it is amazing. This is a, a satin ribbon that ties in a bow in the side here that you can't really make out too much in the photo if you don't know what the dress actually looks like. Now, uh, according to the author uh, uh, of that book and other research I've done, there, are no, there were no other Roman stripe dresses created. Mm -hmm. This was the only one. Ours is the model, and we have, we have uh, double-checked that the, the, the tape with the name yeah. and that number, Joanne was the model in the fashion show. It was number 122 in the fashion show. Dovima then wore it later for this portrait of Norell. Um, so it's really, that was my <laughs> childhood dream of a dress coming true all of a sudden one night late at work just before I was about to head home. That's right. And there's even wear marks on it. I know it's a very yeah. slender size, and the side very. seams are um, slightly. They're they're coming apart. Worn. You know, maybe yeah. someone wore it later. Who knows? But it it, it really. It, I don't know. I don't. It know. was discovered. It was discovered by this dealer in a um, thrift store in Philadelphia. Right. That's the only thing that we know about it. The the provenance of you know where this dress came from, how it ended up there, I have no idea. We have not researched who Joanne, J-O, and then capital A-N-N, -N, who she might have been, what model. We have not, we have not really had the time to do any of that However, kind of research we have, because we've been working on sporting fashion. Yeah, but we have researched other um, pieces yes. with the same, he used the same twill tape or his, his studio right. was the same twill tape with that numbering system. And there's other Norel pieces with the exact handwriting, the numbering system, the, the type of twill tape. So it all, it all makes sense. In fact, one of the models in the fashion show wearing a Norel Mo wore it on the cover of, was it Vogue or Harper's Bazaar? It was one of them. Yeah, one, one of those two. She, she modeled it also for the photograph on the cover of, of Bazaar. And then she herself kept that and still has it to this day. The, the woman is still alive and still has it with her twill tape, mm -hmm. the same twill tape and her name and the number, but without the Norel label. Yeah. So it's amazing how some of these things, you know, <laughs> suddenly come about because of, passion, memorizing fashion history, you know, from years ago, um, being again at the right place at the right time, keeping your eyes open, being willing to, um, to take every opportunity that is offered to you. But even more, instead of taking the opportunities, which we all need to do and should do, but it's also contributing That's exactly to the it. profession. Because in the long run, we are all not going to be here, but hopefully our work will survive and that will then inspire the generations to come, whether they end up being curators or not, but they can build on all of our legacy of work, just as Christina, you and I have built on the legacy of, of scholars, curators, people just passionate that came before us. Yes, exactly.
Well, we got to end it there. Um, thank you for uh, joining us today. And in two weeks, we have a very special um, uh, uh, Salvador Perez, who is the president of the Costume Designers Guild of America, is going to be talking to us about his profession within the design world and how it's connected to the movie, uh, to the movie, yes, and museum fields. So uh, everybody have a great rest of the day. Stay safe, stay healthy, and please wear your masks. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.